Our second video from chapter five is all about calorimetry. And this is where we're going to use the equation that was introduced at the end of the first video. That's this Q equals M C delta T and see all of the applications that that has, where Q is heat, M is mass, C is specific heat, and delta T is change in temperature, right? Final temperature minus initial temperature. And calorimetry is the practice that we can do in the lab to calculate heat of a reaction. Yep. So you see the definition right there. One technique that can be used to measure the amount of heat involved in a chemical or a physical process calorimetry. Maybe you've done it in your previous chemistry course. Okay, coffee cup calorimetry is a common lab experiment. Yep. We're thinking about as a process goes, right, a chemical or a physical process, where is the heat being transferred? Is it being transferred from the substance, so it's heating up its surroundings, or is it being transferred to the substance, so that thing is absorbing heat and cooling down its surroundings? And to figure this out, we look at the heat exchange with something that we've previously calibrated. Okay? So that's known as the calorimeter, where we know the heat capacity, we know the mass, and we can look at the temperature change. Because the change in temperature in the calorimeter can then be converted to find the heat. And that heat change in the calorimeter, as we'll see in just a second, corresponds to the heat change of the substance we're looking at. But it's important that we distinguish between the system and the surroundings, okay? because the substance that we're looking at, or substances, is undergoing the change. That's known as the system. So a chemical reaction or a physical object would be known as a system. But the surroundings is everything else, okay? the other components of the measurement apparatus. So the calorimeter itself is considered to be the surroundings. And the calorimeter as part of the surroundings can either absorb heat from the system, right? So it's heating up. That means our object is giving off heat or it can serve to provide heat to the system. If our system is endothermic, right? It absorbs heat, meaning that has to come from the calorimeter and our calorimeter would cool down. Thinking about it just like a chemical cold pack. Yeah. So think to yourself, what would happen to the surroundings if my system, my reaction was exothermic. Think to yourself, pause for understanding. If we had an exothermic reaction, that means that the system is giving off heat. Therefore, the surroundings would warm up and we'd see a temperature increase in our calorimeter. So a couple parts, right? Calorimeter itself in calorimetry is the device that's used to measure the amount of heat transfer that's involved in a chemical or a physical process. A typical this typically this is happening in an aqueous solution so we're just measuring the temperature change of water but there are other ways to do it as well the reaction as we just mentioned is exothermic then the heat produced by the reaction is absorbed by that solution so we see an increase in temperature of the calorimeter flip those around if the reaction is endothermic the heat required for the reaction is provided by the calorimeter itself that solution meaning it's giving heat to the system, its thermal energy is going down, so we see a decrease in temperature and the solution cool if a reaction is endothermic. Now, a key thing for our calorimeter is we're trying to contain all of the heat transfer within that apparatus. Right? We don't want any heat transfer with the outside environment. You want it to be really well insulated from the rest of the universe, right? Just like if you're trying to keep a drink really warm or really cold, right? you want a well-insulated mug or a Yeti cooler to keep something cold, right? well-insulated to prevent heat transfer. We want the same thing with our calorimeter because for the most accurate results, all the heat exchange has to take place just between the system and the surroundings. We don't wanna lose any. So a quick approximation of a calorimeter, as I mentioned just a second ago, is using coffee cup calorimeters where you just use right, polystyrene or foam cups in the lab. It's just a quick practice in a gen chem lab, but you do have some heat that's lost to the environment, okay? just like you would if you have a throwaway coffee cup from say Dunkin' Donuts. If you have a lab grade calorimeter that's used in industry or research, 
those are designed to have a little bit better insulation. So there's a general scheme of that here for both an exothermic process that's losing heat to the solution or an endothermic process that's gaining heat from the solution. Right? Notice if it's exothermic, the temperature goes up. If it's endothermic, the temperature goes down. But notice in each of these, right, we are well insulated. There's no heat transfer to the outside. And here's a sketch of a coffee cup calorimeter, something that is done in a normal lab gen chem sequence. So what are our principles of calorimetry? Right, let's think about if we had a hot piece of metal represented by M put into cold water, represented by W. We established in the first video from chapter five that things spontaneously reach thermal equilibrium. Okay. So thermal energy is transferred from things that have high thermal energy, right? They're hot to things that have low thermal energy. They're cool. So if hot metal is placed into cool water, heat transfer, thermal energy, right, goes from the metal to the water. Meaning that over time, the temperature of the metal decreases and the temperature of the water increases until they are at the same temperature and they have reached thermal equilibrium. Again, assuming that we have a perfect calorimeter and there's no heat loss to the outside. So if I have a or thermometer that's measuring the temperature of the water, if I put hot metal into the water, we see the temperature go up because that hot metal has lost heat represented by Q to the surroundings, which are is water in this case. So I can do a little bit of math with that idea. If my calorimeter is perfectly insulated, meaning there's no heat loss to the outside, the only heat transfer is between the metal and the water. There's no net change in heat. It's just varying where our thermal energy exists. So the sum of the change in the heat of the metal and the water is equal to zero. And so if we just rearrange that equation by subtracting QW from both sides, tells me that the heat gained or lost by the metal is equal to the heat gained or lost by the water. The value is the same, just the magnitude is different. Right? So they have the same numeric value, one is positive, one is negative. So the heat of both substances is equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign. And if you would have wrote right, negative QM is equal to positive QW, that would still work out at the end of the day. But that's an important equation. System and surroundings. Metal is the system, W was the surroundings. The heat of the system is always equal but opposite in sign to the heat of the surroundings. And I also know right from the beginning of this video that Q is equal to MC delta T. So as I jump into example 5.3 here, which takes up a couple of slides, we'll see how we can use all of these concepts into one problem. Okay. Taking note of all the information that I have. Okay. So I have a 360 gram piece of rebar, okay, so metal. Okay. Thinking about that, okay, that's the mass of the metal. It's dropped into water, 425 milliliters. That's not gonna help me. Okay but I do know that the mass of water, or sorry, the density of water is equal to one gram per milliliter. So this is also equal to 425 grams of water. The water initial temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. The final temperature is 42.7 degrees Celsius. So the other bit of information we'll need is the specific heat of water, which would be provided to you on a test. Okay, that's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So then we're given the specific heat right, of water right here, the mass of water, and the temperature change of water. So that allows us to calculate the heat that went into the water. Now we know that the heat is going into the water because the temperature is increasing. Q equals MC delta T. So I find the Q that way. And then if I know the heat transfer there, that's also equal to the heat that was lost by the metal. So if I'm given the mass of the metal right there in the specific heat, then I can answer this question. 
that asks me to calculate the initial temperature. The only thing that's missing here is the final temperature of the water. Okay. But what is that? Okay. It's not in the question. It requires a little bit of intuition. It's the same 42.7. The final temperature of the water has to be equal to the final temperature of the rebar, the metal, okay, because they've reached thermal equilibrium. The final temperature of these things is always the same. Okay. So with that in mind, right, let's see how this question is solved. I know that the heat given off by the rebar is equal to the negative heat taken in by the water. So Q rebar is equal to negative Q water, what we just talked about. And I know Q is equal to MC delta T. So that's what I do next, right? M rebar, C rebar, delta T rebar. Same thing for water on the other side with a negative sign outside of all of it. Delta T is equal to final temperature minus initial temperature. So I've plugged that in right here. This is all one big equation, just going over two lines here. Everything for the rebar on the top, everything for the water on the bottom. Then I plug in all those pieces of information that I just had, the specific heat for the rebar, the mass of the rebar, okay, the final minus the initial temperature of the rebar. Specific heat of water, mass of the water, 425 grams, temperature change of the water, final minus initial. A lot of math in this case, right? But when you solve for it, you should get a temperature, the initial temperature of the rebar of 248 degrees Celsius. So that's how you solve this example 5.3. And you can always think to yourself, does my answer make sense? If you get a negative temperature, you messed up, right? You can never have a negative temperature. So that means you need to go back and check your problem. But I can also think to myself, does this make sense? Okay. I had water that was initially 24 degrees Celsius and it increased to 42.7. So yeah, my temperature better be higher than 42.7. Okay. But it's all the way up to 248, right? Notice the temperature change is different here and here because it's a different mass and a different specific heat. So don't just look at this problem and think, oh, the difference here is 18.7. So I just have to add 18.7 to 42.7. I see that mistake made on the test a lot. You don't do that, right? Trust the process. Q equals MC delta T on both sides. You solve for the initial temperature, which should be higher than 42.7. Okay. So theoretically, your answer makes sense. So that's the basis behind calorimetry. But usually calorimetry isn't done to look at an example like that, where we're putting a hot piece of rebar into a cool solution of water. We're typically looking at chemical reactions, as you see here. But the same principles still apply, right? Energy is not created or destroyed during a chemical reaction. It just transfers location. So there's no overall energy change. Therefore, I just think about the system as being the reaction and the solution being the surroundings. And just like Q system equals negative Q surroundings, we just saw Q rebar equals negative Q water, right? Q reaction is equal to negative Q solution. And then after that, it's the same idea. Q equals MC delta T. So I see these problems put into play in another equation here. And you, I recommend you try this on your own. You saw 5.3, how that was solved. Try and chop up 5.5 here and see if you can get the final answer. We're given 50 milliliters of one molar HCl, 50 milliliters of one molar sodium hydroxide, both at an initial temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. We put them in a calorimeter. Temperature reaches a maximum of 28.9 degrees Celsius. Okay. What's the approximate amount of heat produced by this reaction? Okay, so I'm asked about the heat of the reaction, but I'm given information for the solution. Okay. So Q reaction is equal to negative Q solution, as we just established. So to find the answer to this question, Q reaction, I'm first going to solve for Q solution. How do I do that? MC delta T. Okay. But what is the mass in this case? Okay. Notice I had well, it got rid of the initial problem, so I'll jump back to it. 50 milliliters of hydrochloric acid 
and 50 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. That's 100 milliliters total. And as we've mentioned in this video, right, density of water, in this case, one gram per milliliter. So 100 milliliters is equal to 100 grams, shown here in scientific notation. This is an aqueous solution. So I use the specific heat for water, 4.184 again, joules per gram degree Celsius. And then the temperature change for the solution, final 28.9 minus initial 22. And so I take this answer here, 6.9 multiplied by 100 multiplied by 4.184. And I get Q solution of 2.9 times 10 to the third joules when I track my units. But remember that's heat of the solution, Q solution. We were asked for Q reaction. Q reaction is equal to negative Q solution. So the final answer for this problem would be negative 2.9 times 10 to the third joules. That would be the correct answer on the test. Something to pay attention to, maybe you've picked up on it by now, maybe not. Right? If you have a negative heat for a reaction, negative Q reaction, that means the reaction is exothermic, which a neutralization reaction is, right? This was HCl and NaOH, an acid and a base coming together. Neutralization from chapter four. Those are exothermic. In this case, it produces 2.9 times 10 to the third, right, or 2.9 kilojoules of heat being produced in that exothermic reaction. If you have a positive Q, that means it's endothermic. So those are the important ideas from this video, knowing how to do calorimetry problems. Q equals MC delta T, and Q system is equal to negative Q surroundings. We just vary what the system and surroundings are. Some other things to have on your radar, not exactly going to be tested on. Right? Coffee cup calorimeters aren't the only type that exist. We also have things known as bomb calorimeters. These are used for reactions with large energy changes, such as combustion. Right? It has a robust steel container that's submerged in water that itself is called the bomb. Right? This is what a bomb calorimeter looks like. Notice the bomb there in the middle. We also have things that are known as whole, bo whole body calorimeters. And this is where a lot of nutrition information can come from. Right? This is a calorimeter that's fully sealed, right, insulated from the surroundings, but large enough to fit a human being. There's only a couple dozen of these in the world. Right? But this measures metabolism under different conditions, different environmental conditions, different diets, different health conditions. That's where, as I just mentioned, we get nutritional information from. This is what a whole body calorimeter looks like. Okay. It's weird because it looks almost like a hospital room or a hotel room, but it's fully insulated. Okay. So that's where we can measure the changes in that room and get information from, okay. such as your nutritional information. So you won't be tested on bomb calorimeters or whole body calorimeters. Just be aware that they exist. Okay. As I mentioned already, the key takeaway is doing those calorimetry problems using Q equals MC delta T using Q system is equal to negative Q surroundings. We finish with one more example test question where we have a different type of application. Here, you're not given a specific heat, you're asked to calculate it. Okay. So I recommend you pause the video and try this one on your own. You should get a final answer of 0 0.231 joules per gram degree Celsius. And I will upload a separate video that shows you how to solve this one. What I will draw your attention to is make sure you pay attention to your units, right? That 0 0.133 moles of cadmium doesn't work as it is. You do have to have a change there. Okay. After you're comfortable with using Q equals MC delta T, then we move on to the final subchapter in chapter five, 5.3, where we learn all about enthalpy.